Hi there. In this part, we're finally going to start talking about some of the bioinformatics we use to learn from the data we're producing in gene expression. In particular, we'll be looking at the questions of bio, uh, of bi clustering and of biomarkers. Bi clustering is useful uh, when we're trying to discover which of our patients have similar diseases. So it's an exploratory technique. Uh, clustering allows us to look into our data and see if patients fall in natural clusters, natural groupings uh, within our within cohorts. Um, from there, we can also look at the genes themselves, though. And for that, we might ask uh, which genes uh, take on particular functions or are active under certain conditions. So bi-clustering is useful in both of those contexts. We'll look at it in more detail. Biomarkers are a fascinating topic, and there are a lot of ways that bi uh, biomarkers can aid us in clinical uh, situations. We're going to look at just a, a very brief, uh, a very brief glimpse of the kind of methods we use for creating panels of biomarkers to help us understand very cl uh, particular clinical situations. Here, I've described the case of screening biomarkers or early detection. Can, can we detect people who are in the earliest stages of a disease? That's that's a, an early detection application for biomarkers. As you can see in this diagram uh, produced by my friend Bing Zhang. Uh, we see that lots of different bioinformatics tasks come into play when we are making sense of gene expression data. We've already talked about some examples of data pre-processing, normalization, looking for bias, examining batch effects. These are examples of pre-processing looked at in the last video. When we get to data mining, we see three major kinds of applications used. The first of these, differential expression, will be handled in the next video. Uh, for, this for this lecture, we're going to talk about clustering and classification tasks. As we see that at the end of the day, we should be able to interpret our data in such a way that we understand better how to frame our next experiment. In, in effect, each biological question produces answers that are in, in, in themselves more questions for us to answer. This is kind of the what we describe as the virtuous cycle of uh, biological experiments. So. There are three major goals that we're going to be talking through in this video and the next, uh, and they relate to class comparison, which is kind of the cohort versus cohort comparison. That's for the next video. And then two other approaches, class detection, which samples are similar or which genes are similar, uh, and that's one of the topics we'll discuss under bi-clustering. And then class prediction. Is it possible to find a set of genes for which the expression predicts a certain clinical outcome? That is something that for which we frequently use machine learning. Now, machine learning is a very, very hot topic, but it can be difficult to take a first step into that field. So we're going to try to, to cover just a basic way that we move into that field next. So it might be useful to start with a, a question about what is clustering. Now, at the upper left, I've drawn what we would call a dendrogram. Uh, it, it's a, a finger-like, thus the name dendrogram, structure that shows how these data relate to each other. Now, we, we may refer to this relationship among the data points as a hierarchy, uh, which is to say that we have uh, one group inside another that leads to the final points. So in data mining, we might try to find a hierarchy that best organizes the samples so that they all fit together um, in by grouping together those points that are most similar first. Now for this, we need to have what's called a distance metric. A distance metric is just a way to say, if I've got this data set and this data set, what is the, what is the relationship between the two? One of the most common approaches we use is called Euclidean distance. So you might imagine in a, in a, a grid, you might have two points, and you ask, what is the distance between those? You would ask, what is their difference vertically, and what is their difference horizontally? And from that, you'd be able to figure out the length of the diagonal. That's a Euclidean distance. So we use methods very like that, even when the data are much more than two-dimensional. Uh, and so that's, that's a very common approach that we use for computing a distance between pairs of data, uh, data points. Now, generally speaking, clustering falls in one of two patterns. One is an agglomerative approach where we start by having each data point in its own group, and then we figure out which ones are closest and call them, them a group, and then figure out which what are the next two closest and join those together, and keep going until we've joined everything together. That's agglomerative, or a divisive approach, where we start with the, the data in space and we ask, 
where can we throw a div dividing line between these to make this group separate from that group? And then once we have this group, can we separate it in a meaningful way? Can we separate this in a meaningful way? That's a divisive plan. So either of these approaches can be used when we're trying to create clusters. The, the other thing I want to point out about clusters is that whenever we create these cluster diagrams, like the, the dendrogram at the upper left, we might ask, how many groups does that represent? And you can note that if you cut them, for example, at this level, you get one, two, three groups. If you cut them at this level, you get one, two, three, four groups. So the, the question of how many groups is it appropriate to cut a cluster into is still open once you've produced a cluster. Now this is an example of the output of bi-clustering. Um, one of the first algorithms for this purpose was created just at the start of this millennium by Cheng and Church, uh, published in the year 2000. I've, I've included the, the uh, reference to get to it. But I've also included a, a diagram here shown from a genome research article showing how this gets applied. In this case, we have cell lines across the horizontal axis. So each of these is a different um, immortalized cell line. And then each gene is represented by a different row in this diagram. So here we've resorted all of the cells to bring together the cell lines that have the most similar patterns of gene expression. These two together, these two together, then these three together, these four together, that sort of thing. And then on the horizontal axis, we've resorted all of the genes, not by alphabet, uh, or where they're located in the chromosome, but rather by how similar are they to other genes for which we've also measured expression. And you can see that in this case, the operation, the bi-clustering, has resulted in what we call a checkerboard pattern. We have a, a, a red square at the upper left, a red square at the lower right, a green square at the upper right, a green square at the lower left. Those are the, the checkerboard. Now, if you, if you suffer from color blindness, this may look like a bunch of grays, and I'm sorry about that. Red and green was the traditional pattern that people used for up and down expression uh, in, in these diagrams a long time ago. So you can see that this is useful if you're trying to understand how the genes group together or how samples group together by gene expression. Now, there are several approaches that have been published. This is an area where lots and lots of people have gotten involved in part because bi-clustering is called an NP-complete problem. That is to say, it's not an easy one to create an algorithm to solve. Um, most of the solutions that are guaranteed to give you the best result are so computationally expensive that no one in the right mind would do them. So we have several approaches here that um, are all very powerful at reproducing clusters out of our data, um, and yet which one is the right option is sometimes quite vague. Um, you, you, may, you may need to know quite a lot about the biology uh, of, your, of your samples to know which one is producing a right clustering result. So Bayesian bi-clustering, the PLAID model, the coherent pattern bi-cluster, and qualitative bi-clustering have all proven themselves to be very powerful in this recent review that we see down here at the bottom in 2012. Uh, and I really like this review because they went through a lot of different tests to evaluate when these things excelled and when they didn't, ex when they didn't perform so very well. Um, in some tests, even the very, the very first implementation, the Cheng and Church implementation, performed quite well. So it's, it's uh, not always a case that the newest algorithm is necessarily going to perform the best. As we see, the, the PLAID model has been through a lot of different iterations. It's been the subject of four or five different publications over time as people refined the methods by which it operated. Now, I, I wanna, before we leave this topic, I want to remind us that there's a, another way in which this expression information is very valuable, and that is as a guide to function. So what we've seen is that for some model organisms, yeast, E. coli, mouse cells, things like that, gene expression data have been captured under a huge diversity of conditions. So maybe you're catching cells at different levels of development, embryos at different levels of development, under different activity conditions, under different stimuli. And if you generate enough of these different conditions, you can group all of these data together to find which genes correlate, meaning that they have high expression at the same time and low expression at the same time across many, many different patterns of development and stimulus and activity. If that's the case, you can begin to impute the function of particular genes. Uh, so the, the article I've cited here at the bottom, Lockhart and Winsler in Nature back in the year 2000, uh, looked at the extent to which genes that express up and down uh, have been shown to ha have similar functions. So if you know one gene is associated uh, as uh, 
part of a phosphorylation cascade, it may be that another gene that comes on and off under the same conditions is also part of establishing this cascade for the cells. You can impute a function for an unknown gene based on the fact that it rises and falls with another. There are some limits to this, but this remains one of the most common ways that we uh, learn about the function of an unknown gene. Now the next application where advanced processing of these data can help us is in the case of biomarkers. Clinical biomarkers can fill many, many different roles, and this is just one listing of, of all of them. One is a, a question of genetic predisposition. It may be that people who have particular alleles for a given gene have a predisposition to develop a, a big disease. We've seen one example of that with the BRCA gene that has caused some people to undergo mastectomies long before any sign of breast cancer uh, has been detected. That's because they know that they have a predisposition to develop that disease. Now, screening and early detection is a really hot area for biomarkers. Imagine if we could detect people who have uh, developed, say, a polyp that has maybe uh, moved in the direction of being an adenoma. Now, they don't have cancer yet, but at some point they may, have, uh, they may find that this early uh, growth in, in their body has become a tumor. So being able to detect it at the very earliest stage that a disease has, has gone malignant for somebody is very, very important. Um, diagnosis is certainly valuable. Being able to understand, for example, which children have developed tuberculosis is very important and can be quite difficult since our primary means of detecting that comes from sputum. So ch children aren't very good at producing sputum, so if you have a, a way to detect from blood or urine uh, that, they have, that they have this diagnosis, that would matter a lot. There's also the question of treatment selection. Some people uh, have a version of the disease that is very amenable to certain drugs, and others have ones that are not. So if you're trying to figure out whether somebody has drug-responsive, drug-sensitive tuberculosis, as opposed to somebody who has a multiple drug-resistant form of the disease, that can help you to decide which treatment is appropriate for them. Right now, we generally just discover that somebody isn't responding to standard treatment, and then start testing to see whether they have uh, a variant that isn't susceptible to that drug. That's kind of a bad way to go. Uh, treatment monitoring is certainly a good one. You'd like to know that the patient is responding to the treatment plan you've selected for them. And when somebody is all clear, you would like to know their chances of remaining so, rather than uh, recurring with a particular disease. Biomarkers can play all of these different roles. Now, the way in which we go about finding sets of of biomarkers that enable us to make a clinical decision can be a little complex. People sometimes use machine learning for this purpose, and sometimes they use a statistical learning method instead. And the goal for these is to create a predictive model. So we start with measurements from all of our samples. From this big collection of data, we're going to make some sort of split between data we're going to use to establish a model and then data we're going to use to characterize that model at the very, very end. But we only get to use that data set, the test set, once. It's a very important thing. So we're going to set apart some of our data that are going to serve as our final check that the work we did on all the other data is worth something. Now we separate the remaining data into a training set and a validation set. From the training set, we're trying to learn two different things. One is which of the things we measured is most useful in making this clinical decision? And the other part that we want to learn is a decision rule. How do we decide on the basis of those measurements that we've selected whether this person is a positive or a negative? So that means that everyone in this data set must have a label associated with them. The truth is that this person does have the disease. The truth is that this person does not have the disease. We want that for all of the people, whether they're in the training set, the validation set, or the test set. So using the data and the labels, we apply machine learning to find the set of genes we most care about and a rule by which we can decide whether this person is a positive or a negative. We can then test this decision rule with that subset of markers to, uh, against the validation set. 
And after we have a, a, a satisfactory performance on the validation set, maybe we're going to try deep learning and we're going to use random forests and we're going to use the lasso regression technique, all these different approaches. One of those is going to give us a model that we really think is the best for uh, in, at the validation stage. And we call that our tested model. Now, and only now, at this very last stage, do we test the, the model in the test set. And hopefully everything goes well, and we find that we have a very good separation between positives and negatives, and not a lot of false positives, not a lot of false negatives. And from that, we can publish an evaluated model built from machine learning or statistical learning. There have been a lot of people who vary from this, uh, this model and, and may reuse their test set, and things like that can produce very artificially good-looking models that are, in fact, absolutely useless in any other context. So it's very important that the test set be used only once, to, to be fair. Now, sometimes people use a rather different strategy. Instead of separating the training data into training and valida in validation and always using that particular breakup of the data, they might choose to use all of the training data in such a way that they alter within, this, uh, within trials which set is used for validation. So you might, for example, cut your data into fifths, and the first time the first fifth is used for validation, then the second fifth, then the third fifth, then the fourth, and then the fifth fifth. So what you're going to get are five different models, but you'll evaluate how much stability you have um, in the model that, that is derived from your data by being able to look across all these different uh, test sets, that are, all these different models that have been built from the data. So if you have relatively few data, you may use a cross-validation study like this in order to maximize the, uh, um, the stability of the model that comes out of it. So there were a lot of messages here, and I realize that the processing methods um, may be a little exotic there. But it, it's, it, it's important, I think, to get an exposure to what machine learning can offer us and, and how it can appropriately be used. So biclustering is a very useful technique for recognizing which samples are similar in the gene expression patterns. But it should also be recognized that it can group together genes that perform similarly, that express similarly, over the pattern of different samples. Both of these rearrangements are very useful for us to understand, to explore the inherent structure of our data. Predictive modeling is certainly very, very valuable, and it's a, a very high growth area for people in computer science to bring machine learning techniques into clinical practice. We hope that over time, these applications will lead to useful biomarker panels that can be useful, useful for a very large variety of clinical applications, not just cancer, not just infectious disease. But it's, a, it's an area where we've really struggled, frankly, to come up with models, predictive models, that apply outside the data sets in which they were originally discovered. I, I believe that in the future we're going to get better and better at both of these applications.